for the first one, I'd like to introduce saying uh, Sonia Blake. Uh, Sonia is the Director of Community Business for the Mayor's Office of Mayor Garcetti's Office of Economic Development with the City of Los Angeles. And then we also have Sebastian De Vivo, and he is a consultant advisor with the Excel Exchange. And then we have Cesar Hernandez, who is the Vice President of Business Banking, Business Banking Sales Manager for U.S. Bank. And so each of them will be bringing to you their expertise and hopefully a way to be able to help you work through a lot of the noise that you've been hearing for getting loans and really helping your business thrive and succeed during this time period and beyond. So, you know, with that said, I, I recognize that there have been some updates um, to some of the, uh, some of the information that we've been getting around the economic injury disaster loan, as well as the PPP. Um, Sebastian, I do want to ask you, I know that you um, are very abreast, uh, very up to date with what's going on. And I wanted to ask you what some of the latest and greatest might be that you've heard um, today and maybe this week. Yeah, of course. Uh, hi, everyone. So Before we jump into it, sorry, this is like, a, this is the real time update. <laughs> so, thanks. Um, today, apparently, we heard that the SBA um, is close to running out of money from the first allocation of the 380 billion or so. Um, how that translated on the ground was essentially a lot of the small businesses that applied for the economic injury disaster loan got an offer for a $15,000 loan, um, which might be great for some companies, but for others whose loan amount was, you know, uh, closer to 2 million, obviously became very distressing. Um, as of right now, we're not sure what's happening. We're not sure whether you should um, accept the 15 uh, or not accept the 15 or um, what. So for now, we do know that there's going to be a, a, another allocation of 250 billion for the EIDL program, which should help backfill some of the, the loans that are in process. Uh, but just be aware um, that again, things are changing very fast, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't apply. Uh, you should definitely, definitely apply. Great. Thank you for that update. And then in addition to that, can you walk us through, I know we've heard a lot about the, around the PPP and we've heard around the CARES Act, and I know that you'll be walking through the EIDL loan at some point soon. Um, but for now, can you just start off by just telling us the difference between those two, just so we can understand? Right. So the EIDL is, if we go to the next slide, um, I, we have some of the details. Uh, it's actually further. Oh, it's further. Along. Okay. Um, so the EIDL is run by the SBA themselves, um, and on a you know on a normal year they process about eight hundred thousand applications. Um, I think thus far in the month of March, there they've received upwards of two million applications. Uh, obviously, they don't have uh, the capacity to deal with this, which is why when the CARES legislation was rolled out. It was, it assigned the uh, underwriting and processing to individual banks. Um, so the big, big difference in essence is that you apply to the SBA directly for the EIDL loan, you apply to a bank for the Paycheck Protection Program. Great, and then you noted here, there are a few things, the three things for us to think about. What are those three things again? EIDL is very different from the uh, Paycheck Protection Program. Um, just keep that in mind. Uh, there's a lot of questions that seem like um, they interact, but they don't. The two programs are completely separate. Two, things keep changing really, really fast. It's really hard to keep up to date on what's going on. Um, so, you know, make decisions and move based on what you know at the time. And then, you know, just wait and deal with whatever comes down the pike later uh and you know the third is a reminder that you know even with banks on the ppp with the sba on the eidl uh there's people behind the system that are actually looking at paperwork and making decisions so that makes it very slow but that also gives you an opportunity to discuss your own situation with the people who are handling your loan um, who will be making the decisions and who will be listening to you if you have any issues or questions or concerns. 
So just keep that in mind. This isn't a big faceless machine handling these. This is a person on the other end of the line. Great, thank you for that. And now, um, Sonia, I know that you're focused a lot on the LA city uh, messaging as well as the county of Los Angeles. Um, somehow city of LA gets the, gets the burden of really responding for all of county of LA. But, um, <laughs> wow. but I would like, you know, I would like to move on to the next slide, which is the question here is, you know, what should people really focus on from a small business perspective? I mean, you have taxi cab drivers, you have restaurant owners, you have all sorts of small business people that are really just worried about how they're going to survive now and also beginning in Q3 and beyond. Right. Right, right. Good question. First of all, I want to thank you for having me on here and uh, Michael and Sebastian, Jonathan, uh, it's great to be with you and all of you here and I'm bringing you greetings from Mayor Garcetti and um, definitely his heart is with us, even though he's not with us on the line. And he's definitely thinking about the city's small businesses and we're working really hard to see what we can do to help provide relief. So to that question, Jonathan, I'd say um, First of all, there are kind of two categories to really think about in terms of resilience and recovery. One is uh, revenue generation, revenue recovery. You know, we're hearing reports from businesses who are, some of whom are experiencing 80% reduction in their revenues, and some, of course, are closed altogether. Um, so there's, what can we do during this crisis time with regard to uh, reestablishing some kind of revenue streams? Um, and then what can we put into place now for the future and um, creating kind of a strong platform for when um, the crisis subsides. So there's the revenue aspect. Then on the other hand, there is the assistance piece and that would be loans and grants and other kinds of bridge gap funding to help uh, to uh, make up for the revenue loss. So in terms of the revenues, what I'm seeing a lot of businesses doing is um, pivoting uh, toward those essential activities. And so uh, if you can either um, reformulate your business concept, your central core business model around some of the essential industries like providing food, um, uh, so some restaurants are now doing some kind of grocery kind of functionality, um, working with county health to make sure they're properly permitted. Um, we're finding folks, of course, doing a lot of telecommuting, uh, a lot of delivery. And so tapping into whatever uh, companies and apps are available to help you to reach your customers where they live uh, in terms of delivery or pickup, um, curbside service. Um, so really think about your business model and see if there are some ways to apply that. You know, if you're a dry cleaner and you're accustomed to your customers coming to you, what can you do uh, since you are st still an essential service? What can you do to maybe do delivery and pickup or curbside and kind of be more um, uh, just kind of adjust to to the times uh, that as they are also thinking about you know this economy and uh, you know with the downturn we have to really look at history and look at prior uh, recessions and look at what kinds of businesses were thriving during recession times a lot of discount stores you know your Walmart your 99 cent stores your target um, because people look, are looking for deals. And in terms of food providers and restaurants, you find that uh, some of the uh, folks like, you know, every table uh, may be doing well right now because they have really healthy, fresh food for uh, $5 meals that you can pick up and go. So I'm not advocating for any particular um, establishments or private concerns um, in these comments, but I am saying that those discount models are things that businesses should look at and try to uh, possibly make up for the revenue loss in volume if, if they can't afford that. Uh, so that's on the revenue side. Then on the assistance side, I like to really look at it in terms of the four different levels of government and then the nonprofit sector. So you've got your federal government, of course, the SBA, and uh, we've heard about those loans. 
the state of California also provides some loan guarantee programs that can incentivize banks to uh, potentially do more business and do loans with our, our businesses. So that's something to look at. And Pacific Coast Regional is a small business development center in the city of LA that works with um, the state of California in terms of helping to provide some of their loans, their loan guarantee programs, jumpstart loans, which are specifically for low to moderate income uh, individuals and business owners up to $10,000. Uh, so Pacific Coast Regional by, might be a group to Google and, and see if there's some more uh, info you can get with regard to the state programs. Uh, the state treasurer's office also has a loan guarantee program. All these things I'm running down are actually all listed in one place, in case you're wondering, how do I keep track of all this? So one of the things that the mayor did uh, was uh, we put together a small business toolkit, which is located on his website at lamayor.org slash loan. And you'll see a resilience guide there, which lists the different types of assistance that's available on the federal, state, county, and local level. The county just uh, opened up a new uh, loan program today and will fund up to 150 applications up to $10,000 for employers of two to 50 employees um, in LA County. So that's something also to look at on the county level. And then of course the city, we have an emergency loan. It's a loan when you have gone to those deeper pockets and uh, you know, you're looking for somewhat of a safety net. If you're located, if you have a brick and mortar located within the city of Los Angeles, then you can look at applying for that loan, which I can tell you more about a little bit later. Great, thank you for that, Sonia. That was great. Um, so now going on to, so back to Sebastian, I believe, for the economic injury development loan. Can you walk us through the application process and then maybe some, you know, do's and don'ts as people fill out the forms? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we do have screenshots yeah. of each section of the, the application. Um, yep. Here it is. That's the, or I think the, the slide before this. Sorry. Yep, there we go. Uh, so this this gives you an overview of the emergency uh, economic injury disaster loan. Um, for those of you who might not know the details, again, it's processed, underwritten, and funded directly by the SBA. Uh, for for-profit businesses, the interest rate is 3.75%, and they're amortizing it over 30 years, which is unheard of and incredibly beneficial. Uh, to help businesses with their cash flow. Uh, and there's no payment for 12 months after receiving the loans. Um, so this program itself, uh, because it's still part of the SBA and the way that SBA is legislated, they're required to seek a personal guarantee and collateral. Uh, the CARES Act removes the personal guarantee for loans under 200,000, so that's great. Um, and if you don't have collateral, that doesn't matter. They can't decline you over that, uh, but they, they have to look. Um, the way that we think on the ground that they've been making their decision, uh, there's a hard credit pull you know, very soon after you apply. So it looks like to a great extent your credit score is driving your approval or decline. There have been quite a number of declines uh, the, you know, again, uh, a lot of people have suffered because of the pandemic. So uh, always um, try to reach someone, go back, try to reapply. Don't take that decline on face value. Uh, and then the loan amount is being set at the last six months of revenue. Um, so they'll look at January, uh, I think September, August, September through January. Uh, and then the total amount of revenue that came into the business is what they'll set the, the loan amount at. Uh, obviously, the turnaround is insane. Um, they're highly impacted. Uh, the earliest loan that we've helped with and know about was submitted on the morning of March 9th. Um, it was approved on March 21st. And then today, the, the loan docs were issued. Um, so at this point, the loan docs have to be mailed back. Uh, they're received by legal at the SBA, uh, certified and then funded. So it looks like at the, f at the fastest, you're looking at six weeks. Uh, most people are likely looking at uh, a lot longer than that. 
So let's say that you've actually received a notice back saying that you were approved for that $15,000. And, you know, what's the time frame do you believe that from the time that you received that notice, which, you know, might have been Tuesday or Wednesday for some people, you know, at that point, are you saying it's going to be a four, or four weeks from that point? Or are you, I mean, what's your perspective? And this, I know this is not your slides necessarily and asking this off the cuff, but what are your thoughts right. on it would be at least four weeks uh, once you get the approval, if you're lucky. Um, because basically what happens is you receive the approval uh, and, you know, let's assume that the 15,000 is not a glitch. Um, you receive that approval, then you have to, uh, they have to generate the loan docs, which you have to mail by sna snail mail with a wet signature uh, to their legal department which then goes into their uh, closing department. Um, so, you know, it still has a, a, a ways to travel before you actually get the funding. Um, there is the $10,000 advance. Some people uh, have been getting it fairly quickly within a day or two. Most people haven't gotten anything. So it seems to be very, you know, haphazard in terms of who gets it or who doesn't. Um, and then just to mention on the 15,000, uh, some people uh, late last night or early this morning, uh, and then it became public and it became a thing. And then that approval disappeared from their console, their dashboard. So the assumption is that this is good news that in fact there is money and that they're gonna look at the application for what it really is and set the loan amount at what it should be um but you know again everything is happening almost you know uh hour by hour different things are happening and we just don't know what's what's coming next um so if we can move into directly to the application um i'll just flag uh, a couple of the really important things most of it should be fairly self-explanatory uh, the uh eligibility obviously is a is a big thing um less than 500 employees. Uh, if you're a sole prop or an uh, independent contractor, you qualify. If you're a single member LLC, you, uh, you're considered a sole prop, so you file as that. Um, nonprofits uh, qualify, so that's fantastic. Um, and then the, the only real trick here is when a business is owned by another business or there are affiliations between several businesses, um, if, if those exist, the total number of uh, FTE employees has to be under 500. Um, so for middle market companies that might be in the three, 400 employee range and have sister companies or subsidiaries or parent companies, then they should look at the, at the rule. But most people you know, are under 500, so they just qualify. Um, so once you check what you are, um, you go into the actual application. Most of it is fairly straightforward. Excuse me. Um, for nonprofits, obviously, there's a, a box that you need to select in order to um, identify yourself as a nonprofit. Uh, your gross revenues then are your top line revenues. So the total amount that you've sold uh, or generated uh, before any expenses or any cost of goods are, are counted. Um, and then your cost of goods uh, can be a little tricky. Um, for, uh, for businesses that manufacture or that wholesale, it's easy. You buy something, you sell it, and your cost of goods is whatever it costs you to manufacture or to buy. Um, for services, uh, anything, any expense that you have that is necessary for you to generate that revenue is considered a cost of sale or a cost of goods sold. And it's good to have it in there um, because uh, it's considered an essential, uh, an essential expenditure for your business. So it counts toward, you know, if the SBA starts looking at uh, your cost of goods, your expenses as part of your loan amount, you want that to be considered a cost of goods because then it'll come, it'll go into the loan amount. Um, and you know, that's, there's a lot of uh, ways that the cost of goods can play out. Uh, definitely talk to somebody if, if you have you know, your own situation, ask them and they'll let you know. Um, then if you're a nonprofit, 
uh, what they're asking for is just your total cost of operations for the last 12 months. Um, so that's what you spent uh, in 2019, essentially. Uh, that's the number that you want to include in that part of the application. Uh, then we move on. Sebastian, can I ask you a quick question? Yeah, of course. Is, is there uh, a, a, an exception for different uh, 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 areas of the economy? I was thinking, for example, of uh, the aviation industry, primarily the concessionaires in the airports. Uh, they started feeling this very, very early. Right. So starting with January uh, 31st uh, actually puts them behind the eight ball because their revenue started going down significantly uh, before that um, because of the uh, reduction in the travel from Asia. Is there any protection there? Right. Um, so there are some industries that have a separate pot of money that you can apply to. Bigger companies also have a separate pot of money that's reserved for you. And the airline industry is one of the, the major ones for that. Um, for those of you I was, that I, are- I was, actually thinking of, I was actually thinking of the concessionaires in the airports. And, and in particular, a number of airports uh, in various cities have requirements where uh, even the large concessionaires have to uh, partner with small women and minority owned businesses. So the, the, so a significant portion of the concessionaires in the airports are small uh, uh, startups, quite frankly, uh, right. that uh, depend on the, the, that travel, especially the international travel for their revenues. And those revenues have been down for some time. Is there an exception for, for that group, which is part of the constituency that the Urban League tries to serve? Honestly, I don't think so. Um, they, they fall under the small business category um, and then they go into the same pot as everyone else. Yeah. Um, so if we move on to the next slide. Um, uh, so again, very straightforward. This is your business information. Um, the only thing worth noting about this section is that you do, uh, on the next one, you do want to have the number of employees currently on your payroll because if you lay off a, a significant number of your employees, then uh, it jeopardizes your eligibility for um, the loan. And if part of it becomes forgivable down the line, uh, that's definitely one of the things that they'll be looking at. So, um, so you know, try to don't make up this number. Don't you know pull it out of thin air. Uh, just be very, very uh, uh, strict and serious with it. Uh, and then if we keep moving to the next slide, um, you have to, every small business that applies has to disclose um, every owner. Uh, and what that means is anybody who has 20% or more stake in the business has to submit um, their information as, a, as an owner. Uh, so um, obviously, when you get to bigger corporations uh, where the shares are much more diluted, uh, it's very it's very different. Um, so you know, for those, it's the SBA is not really a it's not really set up to handle them. Uh, but you know, for the smaller businesses where the ownership stake is is clear and and direct, then anybody over twenty percent has to be here. Um, and then if you go to the next, oh, and if you're a nonprofit, then you want to put your executive director, uh, your chairman of the board, anybody who is legally entitled to enter the organization into a, a legal agreement uh, can be considered an owner. Just do their ownership percent at 0%. Um, Right, and then they ask for your place of birth, which is rather odd, uh, but you do have to be a US citizen or resident to qualify for the loan. 
um, that there are certain things that would bar you from receiving an SBA loan. Uh, these include um, uh, criminal offense. Uh, uh, if you go back, uh, you'll see the 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 list. Um, go down to. Sorry, right there. So uh, any of these would disqualify you from them. Um, quite honestly, between you and me, uh, if uh, I fall under one of these categories, I would still apply. I'd just say that um, I fall under the category apply, try to get it in there, get it in the pool and try to talk to somebody and see if, you know, given the extraordinary circumstances that are happening, um, if the, the regulations change, if anything changes, uh, you never know. Down the line, you might be able to get the, the loan. Uh, this, this is an important, this is only if you pay somebody to help you or if you want uh, the SBA to be able to talk to somebody on your behalf, uh, who obviously, you know, is, is uh, privy to confidential information about your finances. And then the next one. This is um, important and this is where we see a lot of the questions. So the CARES Act included this provision, a uh, $10,000 advance for anybody who applies. Uh, it's forgivable. Um, you, it's, it's set up very similar to the IRS system. So the funds are meant to be deployed quickly uh, and given to you to you fast. Uh, everybody should check and say yes, because, you know, worst case scenario, you get declined, you still get to keep it. It's free money. Free money is a good thing these days. So everybody should apply uh, and make sure that they have the, the correct information to get the funds. Um, I'm sure there are going to be a few questions about what happens if I don't take the loan? Um, does it count toward my loan amount down the line? Uh, the quick answer is we don't know yet. Um, we haven't seen anybody get the advance and then either refuse the actual loan or get declined for the actual loan or ask for a reduction in the, in the loan amount. So we don't know what happens to the, to the 10,000 uh, if these, these come into play. Um, but, you know, as, as, we, as we find out stuff, you know, as it happens, we're happy to let you know. Uh, can I ask you a question about this one? Sure. Um, with respect to the ten thousand dollar loan, I see a, a routing number and account number. Uh, is there a an avenue for people who uh, don't have access to a bank or a credit union uh, to say have money transferred to a um, uh, a prepaid credit card, or do they have to wait for a check? That's a great question. Um, I don't know. Um, I think a lot of this hasn't been thought out really. So, you know, it was somebody's idea was we need to get the money out there quickly. Okay, the quickest way to do it is through a, a, an ACH or a wire. So we need their account number. Yay, okay, let's go ahead, let's do it, that's it. And then nobody thought to ask these kinds of questions. So, so there's no processes in place yet to, to deal with people who might not fall into that category. Um, uh, my understanding is that, that, uh, that, that some of the credit card companies are looking to, for, uh, to develop ways to, to address that. And maybe I think, Sonia, I think uh, the, the mayor's office may be a, a part of that, uh, that discussion. Um, are you familiar with that? No, no, not off the top. Refresh me. Um, uh, where, where, what's your understanding of where that conversation is, where it stands, and then I can fill in the gaps if I know. Um, that, that companies like MasterCard are working with uh, uh, the city to try to uh, um, find a way to get uh, uh, these assets to people who are uh, unbanked and instead mm -hmm. of having them you go to the cash you know, the check cashing places that uh, charge exorbitant fees for cashing uh, a, a check that everybody knows is good. Yes. Uh, way, yes. Ways to avoid that, ways to, to address the issue and, and avoid fraud and so on and so forth. I know. My understanding is that those discussions are, are, are going on 
Yes. And, uh, uh, they are. We, we will probably... Go ahead, please. Oh, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> Uh, there's a little bit of a delay. Um, our team is not working on that per se because we're working with the job creators. So I'm in the Mayor's Office of Economic mm -hmm. Development and we work with business owners. Uh, but there's another team, the Mayor's Office of Economic Opportunity, and they work with private residents, job seekers, folks who maybe are going through the community college system, a lot of our social service kinds of uh, programs. And they work on financial literacy and housing and affordable housing and things like that. And they are working on that. Their team did reach out to me and just uh, connected the dots so that our banking contacts can uh, participate, however, and they're the lead on that. So if anyone needed more information, uh, you could certainly email me and I can connect you with the team that's working on that. Uh, thank you very much. We'll probably have a separate webinar just on that, if, th if that's possible. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Great, Michael. Now, Sebastian, to wrap, do you want to wrap this up and then we're going to move on to the PPP? I do recognize everyone. Thank you for your questions. We will be coming back to your questions for, during the Q&A. Um, quite, a, quite a few. You have stemmed a lot of conversation, Sebastian. So, <laughs> so, so but let's go ahead and, and wrap up this little piece and go to the PPP and then we'll go back to the Q&A. Yeah, so the, the, the common wisdom right now is there's a lot of, we don't know, we don't know, we don't know what's gonna happen. Just apply, do what you can, get in the queue, uh, and then you know things will get sorted out on the ground. You wanna be part of the people that are on the queue. Um, and then just uh, in case anybody's interested, so we're tracking the timeline on uh, how this the process is panning out for the disaster loan. So as I mentioned, uh, March 9th was the earliest application that we submitted, and that was on the original system. So you uploaded documents along with the application, uh, which meant that uh, they, didn't need to, they didn't need to be required separately. Um, the approval was received on the 21st, then that system crashed on the 26th, and on the 30th, the new system went live, which is the current one where you don't upload any documents, uh, the one we just went through. Um, so on that initial loan for March 9th, the loan docs were issued uh, on the 8th, which is today. It feels like 100 years ago, but no. Uh, and then, you know, once they receive the loans, uh, the loan docs through snail mail with the wet signature, um, they'll issue the wire and we'll update the, the timeline once we have that date. Great, thank you for that. Of course. And, and again, well, and again, team, um, we'll go, our, our people on the call, we'll go ahead and, and make sure that we, all of your questions are being answered um, at the end of this. Um, in the meantime, I did want to ask Cesar Hernandez and just, by the way, thank you again for joining and your patience. So you, can you walk us through um, the Paycheck Protection Program Sure, it's my, my pleasure. Thanks again for having me and uh, thanks to the Urban League, Los Angeles Urban League for hosting this uh, webinar. Um, well, as Sebastian was, was discussing, the Paycheck Protection Program also is an implementation of the, the CARES Act, uh, a little different than the, the, um, the EIDL that uh, Sebastian was discussing. Um, there is gonna be some, some terms that may overlap and I can give some context to that um, kind of at the end of my presentation. Um, I'm gonna be speaking broadly as to some of the um, kind of items in within the Paycheck Protection Program, program uh, because you know, the banks have received guidance from SBA on how we should implement it, but the processes will differ between banks, right? So obviously I represent US Bank. We have our process, but the other banks uh, local banks will have their own individual process uh, within the, the implementation of the uh, Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, we've all heard it, there's 350, 349 billion available uh, in forgivable small, uh, small business loans. These are intended to pay employees and keep folks employed at work during the eight week um, period following the funding of these loans. Um, We've, uh, we've seen uh, some of the, the, the loans already started to get funded. Um, the terms of these loans will be the same for all applicants. Uh, payments are deferred for six months, so you won't have to make any payments uh, at all um, during this, this, uh, this six month um, um, time. Um, the interest rates are 1% fixed, like that is unheard of. 1%, it's almost free you know, interest there of interest. 
Uh, repayment term is a two-year um, amortization and, and, uh, and fixed term, and no collateral is required. So there's a 100% guarantee through uh, the SBA. Um, you don't have to worry about uh, putting any assets up for, for collateral. Uh, now these loans are, um, um, there's a possibility of having these loans forgiven. There's a couple stipulations within that. Uh, proceeds should be used to cover payroll costs and overhead costs, uh, such as mortgage interest, rent, uh, utilities, you know, anything necessary to keep the doors open, so to speak, during the eight week period following the funding of the loan. Uh, you, may, you have to make sure that um, employee headcount and compensations are maintained at the levels prior to the event here um, that we're experiencing, right? Um, uh, payroll co uh, costs are capped at $100,000 on an annual basis per each employee. So you would have to, uh, when I go into the, the, the calculations, we'd have to subtract any uh, amounts uh, beyond the 100,000 for each employee as we're calculating uh, how much we're, we're applying for, so to speak. Uh, so there's going to be a, a high volume of applications, and uh, we're anticipating that no more than 25% of the loan can be used uh, for non-payroll costs. So minimum of 75% of any proceeds uh, should be used to cover payroll. Okay. Um, just, just go ahead. You're on the hundred thousand cap. So sure. let's say you have an employee that is making ninety-five thousand dollars, and your payroll costs for them are another ten grand. So that's 105. Yes. You, that, so only five of that is able to be capped, right? Or able to, able to be accounted for plus that 90. We're going to cover um, the, the calculation and, and what goes into that on another slide, but I can, I can touch on that. Um, essentially, uh, for that amount over 100,000, um, it, it it, it'll exclude any uh, non wage um, uh, cost to the employer, right? So benefits. Uh, you know, medical benefits, insurance, things of that nature. Uh, but the wages, the, the wages uh, that the employee earn are capped at 100. So it's only so wages. Uh, okay. Only wages. Great. Exactly. Okay, good. Next slide. That, that'll include like commissions and, and tips and things. Okay. That, that's part of the wages. Okay. Uh, we'll move on to the next slide there. Uh, so the el eligibility, who, who is eligible for this? Um, any small business owner, um, similar to the uh, the previous uh, uh, loan we discussed, uh, fewer than 500 employees, which you know most most businesses um, that we're working with are uh, small businesses that meet the SBA uh, size standard. So there might be some some um, uh, businesses that um, exceed the 500, but we may still qualify. I would recommend you visit the SBA website to find out more specifics on that. Um, any 501c3, so nonprofits with uh, fewer than 500 employees. Individuals that operate as sole, as sole proprietors, independent contractors, self-employed folks uh, that carry a trade, you know, we have, uh, you know, gardening, uh, construction, contractors, things like that. Um, any tribal business that me meets the SBA uh, standard of, of, of SBA, uh, 501c19. Veteran organizations uh, would qualify under that. Or folks in the uh, accommodation and food service sector, uh, the 500 employee rule applies per physical location. So you may have um, you know, folks that have several um, um, working locations so, so that it's not a cumulative of all 500 employees, it's per location. Um, and if you're operating a franchise or receive financial assistance from uh, an approved small business investment company, the normal affiliation rules do not apply. So. Uh, just you know, uh, keep in mind that that 500 employee rule threshold includes full time, part time, and any other status employee that you might have, like a seasonal worker. But that in, that includes that in the, the full count. Okay. Uh, so we'll move next to uh, loan amount. So how much can we can we apply under the program? Um, loan amounts can be up to 10 million dollars. Uh, but essentially what you're going to be looking at is the average of your payroll costs for the previous 12 month period. So just think back from today, go back 12 months and get the average of your payroll and multiply that by two and a half times. Right? So if you're, you know, if your payroll on an annual basis, 120,000, the average would be 10,000 a month. And essentially you would, qual you would uh, qualify to apply for $25,000. That's the way that would work. 
uh, two uh, categories. I, I, Go ahead. Ask, ask you a quick question. Sure. Because uh, we, we're talking about small businesses, uh, and and we're talking about them in the context of businesses. Uh, but again, a lot of our constituents that that will not understand a lot of the, this at first blush are they, they don't know that they're independent contractors. I'm thinking right. about people who do housework. Yep. Um, so that that person who uh, uh, works five days a week at five different houses, uh, that person should be able to apply for this and right. get two and a half months worth of what they have been paid. The problem is going to be a lot of those people uh, that they, they're they're a cash business. Is right. there any way to give them some protection? So. Um... And, and when we when we talk about how to substantiate that, we're going to look at the, the the easiest way to break that out is: Are you a W two employee or are you a ten ninety nine employee? Most of you out there that are independent contractors would receive, you know, income through a ten ninety nine at the end of the year. If you are on a cash kind of basis and you're not receiving a ten ninety nine, uh, there may be opportunity for you to substantiate your income through bank statements. Uh, other tax returns, uh, things that uh, you would be reporting, you know, kind of an official uh, um, um, uh, reporting to the IRS and things. Um, uh, but I would, I would check specifically with, with the bank that's processing your loan. Uh, but there is, through the guidance that we're receiving SBA, there's, there's a, a very broad uh, way of, uh, for us to, to verify this. A lot of the process will be a certification process, which means um, the individual would be certifying that that's the income that they are that they are obtaining. Uh, we'll we'll do some some verification, um, but again, I, I won't go specifically to what each bank will do because the process will differ. But my 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 educated guess is that there's going to be some some verification with bank statements, uh, possibly a tax return. Um, you know that's. That's my thought kind of at, at, this, at this point. They should be, however, applying for this. If, if, you're, not, that, that, if you're not working for someone and obtain the W-2, because obviously that's a whole separate uh, part under the CARES Act, right? If you're, if you're a W-2 employee. Um, but if, if you're a household employee, things, like, things of that nature, there's, um, there's, a, 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 there's still a way that you may be able to qualify. That, that's, that's important to know because uh, that's, that's a very large portion of, of the population that we serve and uh, in this group will we, we'll need uh, our assistance in, uh, in applying for this, I believe. Yeah. yeah. And, and that, that'll open up a conversation for a later date on, on how do you protect yourself. Um, you know, when you are a household employee or someone that's more on a cash basis, uh, you know, we can possibly do a, a, a part of it of another webinar in the future on how you can document that income on a month to month basis so that you could have, you know, anytime something of this nature does occur, um, you have that, you know, um, to protect yourself. With, right? Thank you. That's very helpful. Very helpful. Yeah. Um, so I won't go through all the lists, but, you know, if you are an employer and you have employees, it's a list of how we, we would sum up the, uh, the compensation, if you you know, in respect to your employees, um, um, so you know, salary, commissions, any compensation, uh, payments of cash or tip equivalent, and all the other uh, benefits that you'll be paying out. Um, again, this is all capped at a hundred thousand when it comes to wages, um, um, and, and and we we would take the sum, so the gross of all the the um, expenses in salary in your salaries and wages and and, 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 and uh, cost, and then that's how we would come up with the um, uh, calculation of uh, two and a half times the average. For independent contractors, self-employed folks, so again, part of what we're discussing, um, so any wages, commissions, income, not to exceed 100,000, uh, we would, we would uh, prorate that over the 12 month period. Um, um, and, and again, we will find ways to, to get that verified. Um, um, under the program, okay? All right. Now, loan forgiveness. I, I did mention that the, this loan has terms uh, when it's initiated and funded. However, there's a, a very important piece of it, which is the loan forgiveness part of it. Um, 
um, there's some, some components that we have to pay very close attention to in order for you to have this loan forgiven because you will owe money if you don't use the amount of this funding for other than your payroll cost and overhead. So example, if you take this and go buy, you know, um, extra material for a, a, a job that you're working on or something of that nature, um, that would not be appropriate under this program, right? Um, no more than 25% of the loan must be used for non-payroll cost. That's very key. So 75% of the funds from this loan must be used for payroll. Okay, that's, that, that should be very clear on that because if for some reason you do not substantiate that in the eight week period following uh, the, 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 the funding of your loan, if you cannot substantiate that 75% of that income, and I'm sorry, 75% uh, of that loan was used for salaries and, and, um, and, uh, and you know, people's paychecks, the loan will not be forgiven, okay? Um, another component of it is that staffing levels must be remained at the same level. So the headcount of your staff should remain the same as you had it before the event, right? Before, you know, we had this um, uh, 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 crisis, right? Uh, so you have until essentially till June 30th to restore your full-time employment and salary levels if you've already made changes. So you might be asking yourself, well, I already laid off some folks, right? Well, you have time to rehire them after you get the funding. It's not like you have to have them employed now, um, but you do you you must maintain that um, um, the eight week period following. So you have you have some time to ramp up and get folks uh, back in back at work. Uh, but these are two two key components of this um, um, that 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 would uh, ex exclude you from having it forgiven if it's if it's not followed, right? And, and again, I'll, I'll repeat that most of this will be a certification process. Uh, so a lot of it is, is um, the banks will be asking these questions when the loans are forgiven. And there may be some need to verify this through, you know, payroll manifest or, 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 or uh, pay stubs, things of that nature. But most of it will be you just uh, certifying that, that you've already done this. Okay. Um, we'll go to the next slide. Uh, so, so applications, what does the process look like? Uh, banks have already started taking applications for small business and sole proprietors that are single owner businesses as of April 3rd. Um, those applications are already in process. We've already started to see uh, funding on those, on those loans. Uh, I know there were some reports in the media that $7 billion has been issued already. What I will, what I will caution is that those figures are the figures of the banks requesting guarantee from SBA. Um, different than the EIDL, this is a loan that the bank is issuing funds for and we're obtaining guarantee from SBA. So when we request the, 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 the guarantee, it doesn't mean loans being funded, it just means it's being processed. Um, and, and that's the figure that you're seeing out there, that, that $70 billion um, is the, the requests that have come in, okay? Um, starting April 10th, so, you know, just tomorrow, we're able to take applications for independent contractors or folks that are self-employed, okay? Um, you can apply to any, any of your local bank that's federally insured. I know some credit unions are, are, are involved in the process. Um, I would check with your, with your local bank um, as to what their process is. As I mentioned, every bank is, is, is processing things a little bit different. Some banks are taking paper applications and processing those. Others may be doing things digitally. Um, I've done some kind of shopping myself to see what uh, banks are doing out there. I will say that uh, the majority of banks that I looked at have some sort of an inquiry form that you're showing interest in the loan on their website. Um, that would be the best way to look at that. I saw some questions about you know, if you don't have a relationship with a bank, um, some banks are processing for non non customers. Um, I would say, uh, but you know, consult with with the bank. Uh, SBA doesn't break that out um, on their site. What they do have is a uh, a list of banks that are participating in the program, 
uh, but you would still have to uh, do a little homework and, and reach out to the, the, the bank that you're working with or that you potentially want to work with to see if they would be able to process that application for you. Um, the deadline for this is June 30th. Um, that just means for, to apply and to receive a loan. Um, and um, again, I would, I would encourage you to, to uh, come to your bank um, as soon as possible to get this if you haven't already expressed interest so that you can be in the queue um, and, 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 and just be, be wary of the fact that there's gonna be a significant amount of applications out there um, and be a little bit patient kind of with the process as, as uh, Sebastian mentioned, there's, there's actual you know, humans and behind the scene having to process these. Um, and so, so it is gonna be a little, uh, uh, you know, a little bit of a process. As I mentioned, you know, we started taking applications on the third, we started seeing funding just yesterday. So the turnaround time can possibly any be anywhere from a few days to maybe a few weeks, um, depending on your response to some of the questions that you may come up you know, with, with your bank. Great, Th thank you, Caesar, for, okay. um, for that info. Uh, with that said, I know that uh, the attendees, I know that we told you guys that we would only be going for an hour. It looks like um, we've been receiving a lot greater information and some real time questions and I, I think it's really added to the program. This will go a little bit longer than seven o'clock, so apologies if you plan on ending at seven, but please stay on um, for your questions to be answered as well as uh, to continue going through some of the LA City and LA County items. So with that said, Sonia, um, we'd like to kick it off to you to talk about the uh, City of LA Small Business Microloan Program, if you can. Okay, terrific, happy to. Uh, so if you go to, okay, there's the URL. Um, you can, there's a shortcut to that lamayor.org slash loan. So um, the City of LA emergency uh, microloan is a, oh yeah, there you go, right there, you can see that. Um, it's a, a microloan that has uh, some, a couple different options. One option is a 0% a zero percent uh, interest for up to 18 months with a six months deferment in payment. Uh, alternatively, if you wanted to have a longer uh, repayment term, five years, you could opt for a 3% loan for for-profit or 2% for nonprofit, and repayment would not start for 12 months. So the idea of this loan, and it's a micro loan, five to twenty thousand um, dollars. The goal is to preserve our brick and mortar business locations that intend to stay open or reopen, um, and um, either retain or uh, rehire uh, employees. So that's what we're looking for in the underwriting. It's for um, businesses that are a hundred employees or less. Um, and just thinking through some of the things, there are no fees on this loan. We want to put businesses in a better position at the end of this crisis and not have people overwhelmed with debt. So you'll see a lot of these programs have low interest or this one has no interest and no interest option, uh, which is really important. When you're looking at these loans, um, um, oftentimes it's um, some businesses find it helpful to start with the SBA. The federal um, program has more funding. Um, and then sometimes not, not everybody's eligible for that. So it may make sense to then look uh, at some state opportunities. Um, there's um, the state iBank, which has a loan guarantee, as I mentioned, uh, treasurer's office. Um, there's been some uh, relief for businesses in terms of uh, the sales and use tax um, and uh, postponing uh, those payments. So if you check out some of these websites, you'll be able to find out uh, the opportunities. Um, but as far as the city loan, um, it's a, a, a relatively smaller budget. $11 million is made available for these loans. Um, although uh, there's no credit minimum, and so um, that's a factor. Um, now, the underwriters will be looking for the principal business owner to have reasonable and responsible credit and any derogatory marks to have a good explanation for that. Um, 
we're going to be looking for cash flow historically, so before the crisis, that uh, would have been sufficient to service the debt that's requested. Uh, and you do need to be a, a physical location in the city of Los Angeles. So on uh, the, the web page for the loan, you'll find a locator. So you will be able to put in your zip code and be able to just confirm that you are indeed located in the city of Los Angeles. Because some people get a little bit confused. You may be in the county and just outside of uh, the city boundaries. So uh, so I think that's pretty much the, the uh, long and short of that. And um, just to reiterate, um, the resilience guide, which you can download and that lists the different programs that we've been able to identify on the various governmental levels and then some nonprofit partners as well. Great, and then we actually have a slide for you on the resilience toolkit if you actually wanna talk about that. Oh, sure, just a little bit, just to highlight uh, highlight it. We've tried to make it really easy to use. And we start off with some of the health guidelines and practices uh, for those businesses that uh, are conducting essential activities and uh, maybe need to uh, be reminded of some of the hygiene practices that are advocated by the CDC and the County Department of Public Health, um, which uh, the mayor is really following closely and, um, you know, and, and uh, communicating those health guidelines. So we included some of that information and some handy links for public health uh, information uh, that might be useful for businesses. Then we go into um, assistance for employees because we know that a lot of business owners are really concerned about their employees getting the support that they need. And so we have a listing there of some of the programs that are available, some of the new programs specifically for the crisis, and then ongoing programs like the city's work source centers that have always been helping people to find positions and now even more so. And then we go into uh, assistance for business owners, for businesses, and uh, have a chart there with a comparative listing of different programs that might be helpful and then how you can get in touch with them. So we're gonna do a companion guide on uh, policy. So our team has been, we had been doing daily COVID-19 updates because things were changing so quickly. Now we're moving to a weekly model. So we'll be uh, doing those updates weekly if you wanna just see, okay, what did the president just do? The governor, the mayor, you know, it's kind of a lot to follow. So we kind of put it all together in one newsletter. And so uh, you can get in touch with me if you want to get on that mailing list and uh, we can loop you in on those policy changes. So this toolkit is really designed for business assistance and then we'll do a separate guide on policy updates. So uh, recent legislation and then links to uh, the different governmental levels and offices where you can just click on the link and get their latest announcements. That would be very helpful actually. That would so, be great. Thank you, thank you for that. Yeah, the the next piece, and I, I know that we've had a lot of questions, and um, Candice, I'm not sure if you want to go through the Q&A piece first or go through the chat box, um, but what are you, I mean, what are, what are we hearing this in terms of the questions if you want, as you want to go through them, Candice? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've actually been taking a look at both and trying to kind of categorize them a little bit, so I'm going to be kind of quick. Um, I think, you know, certainly for Sebastian, there have been some questions around uh, EIDL, um, specifically around the $10,000 uh, advance, um, wanting to know if taxes will need to be paid um, at the end of the year if they get the advance. Um, that is one question that came up. Um, they're curious about. We, we don't know, but you're likely to, to be taxed on it. Got it, got it. Um, and is the 10,000 uh, advance um, forgivable even if the application is declined? Uh, if the application is declined, it is definitely forgivable. What right. we don't know is uh, if you don't, ex if, if the application is accepted and you don't take the loan, can you still keep the 10,000? That's what we don't know. Gotcha, okay. And um, there have been questions about S Corp, um, just in general asking, um, you know, what about S Corp, uh, which I think is tied to EIDL. That is one thing that's come up on a couple of occasions. Anything you can share on that? 
um, yeah, S corps are absolutely eligible for the EIDL. Um, and I don't know, Caesar, if you want to mention how S corps fit into the PPP program. I yeah, know um, they're, they're definitely eligible. We'd have to look at uh, the ownership within that within that S corp, right? Um, so as 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 with the EIDL, like any any ownership of over twenty percent uh, must be um, um, on the application, uh, but definitely something that we can still process through through that um, uh, PPP. Great. Another question, I think, for Sebastian: Does applying for the EIDL prevent uh, someone from qualifying for unemployment benefits or PUA? That is a great question. Um, I myself don't know. Uh, I would apply for both anyway. Got it. Uh, one you, question: either, You don't think they should? <laughs> um, well. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I made the, um, I, I just think uh, we, we need to be careful on on the, um, you know, as we mentioned before, it, what's, what's very important is is how you're getting paid, right? If you if you are a, if you are definitely a 1099 employee and you're self you know self employed that way, um, that's something that we we definitely would qualify for either the EIDL or through the Paycheck Protection Fund, right? Um, but for that's a question that comes up a lot with our clients, right? So a perfect example is a, a, a beauty salon or barbershop, right? Um, you have 10 barbers that work there. I own the barbershop, but I have 10 barbers that work in there. Um, those folks pay me rent, right? Are they my employees? You know, will they qualify for unemployment? Um, the answer is no, they're, they're all independent contractors, right? They're reporting their own income. You know, they have their own expenses. Uh, so I would just say talk maybe talk to a talk to your accountant about how you're reporting your income. Um, you know that's just kind of my recommendation. And it's worth mentioning at this point that um, the LA the city of LA has nine business source centers uh, which offer free assistance. Um, the SBA funds small business development centers like Pixel Exchange, which give you free assistance. So definitely take advantage of these resources and ask them questions like these. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I'll flag the fact that as an independent contractor, you qualify both for, and you qualify for an EIDL, a PPP and unemployment. So how to bring these three together, we don't know, but definitely worth looking into. Yeah. Great. In fact, the city and the county are partnering together on a project called uh, the LA Cares Core. And so there's a team of about 40 uh, uh, folks uh, staffing a call center and they'll be able to help people kind of understand the distinction between uh, the different types of loans, um, uh, SBA loans, if they need assistance with that. And then um, as Sebastian mentioned, the business sources can help people with the city loans. So we're kind of working together. And so I'll put in the chat, uh, the uh, web address to visit for uh, that uh, website and then the call center uh, and then uh, all that information that hopefully will be really helpful for some folks. That's great. Another question uh, that's come up, is there assistance for individuals that have lost their income from ride share driving? So Uber, Lyft, things such as that. Aren't they? Independent contractors, right? I would Correct. imagine so. Yeah. Right. That 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 falls under that falls under the pay, paycheck protection program. Perfect. Uh, if you're, you know. Perfect. Okay. Um, hey, sorry, see. sorry, Sebastian did. Sorry, Sebastian just said and the and the EDL. Just want to make sure we offer that. Qualify for both programs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Correct. All, all programs. Yeah. Right. Great. Okay. Um, let's see here. I'm just kind of going down the list. I think we've actually answered quite a few of these. Um, how can I meet the 75% of salary for loan if I'm the only employee? Does it count for my salary for not being able to provide services? That's a good question. Um, as, a, as an independent a contractor or a self-employed individual, and you're the only employee, then the salary is, is, is what you're paying yourself, right? Uh, that can be difficult sometimes when you know you're a 
you're a, a self-employed individual and you don't pay yourself a salary, right? You just kind of work off the net, the net profit. Um, so we'll, we'll take a look at what, what your net profit is, you know, on that rolling 12 month period, we'll prorate it as a, as an annual salary, you get the average on that. And you want to just maintain that, that salary level for that eight week, eight week period. Again, I'll repeat, a lot of this is a certification process. So it's you certifying what salary you're, you're paying yourself. Um, and, and I understand a lot of that is going to go right to your bills, right? To your mortgage, your rent, um, which is understandable and definitely can be used under the program. I would just be, I would just be uh, cautious to keep that documentation as to how much you're truly paying yourself in that eight week period. And that's how you'll, you'll be able to substantiate that your, 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 your level of salary is at a 70, at least 75% uh, of what you would have been before. So we'll take that, 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 you know, baseline from the net profit you made and we'll give, we'll give a calculation based on that. And then you want to stay at that, at least 75% of that. A, a, good, a good way to do it might be if you have a business account, then what leaves your business account and goes into your personal account is what you're paying yourself. So that's your payroll. And that's what you use to certify it. If you mm -hmm. have them mixed up already, this is a good time to separate them. Right. Good point, Sebastian. Great. Just a couple more here. Um, the mayor spoke about a CARES Corps for businesses yesterday during his speech. Can you talk more about that? I'm not sure. sure. Yeah, so that's the program that I was referring to when I was saying it's a partnership with the county and the city. Mm -hmm. So CARES Corps, you know, there's been so much interest and confusion. Uh, Sebastian's done an amazing job and Caesar also really kind of demystifying these loans. But if you're not on this webinar and you haven't heard this, you know, how would you really be able to parse? When do you apply for PPP? When do you apply for IDLE? And how do you go about all that? So um, the county, uh, had uh, had this great leadership in establishing this call center and pull together various uh, teams who can help people uh, just kind of walk through those uh, those websites. So what the city has done is we've put together uh, kind of a one-stop website, website that clarifies and compares the two loans at coronavirus.lacity.org slash CARES Corp. And I did put it in the chat. So if you go there, then you'll be able to see um, what the city and the county have put together to help business owners understand a comparison of the loans. And then if you want to apply, you can click right from there when you see which one or both you want to apply for. And then if you find you're not eligible for the SBA loan, then there's information down below about the city's emergency loan and you may indeed be eligible for that one. So you can click to apply for the city loan uh, from that same central page as well. Or if you need assistance with doing, uh, doing that, then you can um, reach out to any one of our nine business or centers and they can help you with the city loan. So there's the SBA loans on the federal level and then the city loans, that one website, you can kind of look at and navigate and compare uh, all of those options. Excellent, thank you. All right, um, I think we've gone through quite a few of these, some of them. Um... There's one on forgiveness and I, I'm not sure if I have that one on, around the forgiveness of the loan. Okay, I know there was a question, maybe just for, for clarification, what does forgivable mean? That question has come oh, up. Okay, uh, so yes. under the, the Paycheck Protection Program, forgivable means that you would not have to repay that loan. Um, it would essentially become a grant. Um, um, and just, just ensuring that you meet, at least, you know, not, not at least, but both the, um, um, the items that I mentioned about keeping your staffing levels at, a, at you know, at least uh, um, up to what you had it prior to the event. And we're talking about headcount and we're also talking about um, a salary uh, amounts um, and, and that the, the funds in this loan uh, be used so at least 75% be covered um, under the payroll. Uh, so no more than 25% can be used for overhead costs. And that's really key with this in order for it to become uh, forgivable or a grant not not have to be repaid uh, because if those items are not met uh, you after the six month deferment period 
you would begin making payments on that. Great. Thanks, Caesar. There is one other question um, tied to uh, forgiveness. Do you need to be able to trace the proceeds to the payroll expenditures or do you just need to show the payroll expenditures? For example, what if you use an existing line of credit to cover the first payroll after the loan is funded and then you use the PPP loan to pay down the credit line in that amount? Or does it only count if you can show that the funds went directly from the SBA to your account to the payroll expenditures? I mean, that's a good question. I mean, if you're using a line of credit, definitely, um, you know, there, there should be a, a, a paper trail, so to speak. Um, so always, you know, always have the documentation, um, you know, you know, have the, the funds come through your account, you can make the payment from your account. Again, this is a certification process. So a lot of it will be your, your certifying that that, that happened. Um, and just be ready to, in case it is, there is an audit process, just be ready to provide that, that documentation. Uh, so definitely use, you know, to, to Sebastian's point, don't use your personal account. If you're already doing that, try to not commingle those funds now. Um, again, this is, this is, you're working with the SBA, you're working with the government. So you want to make sure that you have, you know, kind of uh, all your T's crossed and your I's dotted, right? So make sure you're putting your monies into a, a checking account that's, that that's, has your business um, uh, transactions only. Um, and, and if you are making a payment to the line of credit, that should come from your, from that same account, right? Where the monies are coming in. So that would be, that would be just fine. Great. And Caesar, I'm just going to sneak one or two more in before, before, because I think we're, we're pretty much done. But um, one question that has come up, um, what's the chance of self-employed and or independent contractor getting a PPP loan at this point, given that funds are limited? Um, well, I mentioned that the, 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 the figures that I saw were $70 billion have been requested, you know, out of the $350 billion. Um, there's, still, there, there's still funds available. Um, I know that as we speak, Congress is drafting legislation on an additional kind of stimulus uh, package, which includes some more funding um, for, for these programs. Uh, I mean, obviously, I can't guarantee that, but, but um, you know, I feel confident, you know, that, that there will be funds available if you need it. Uh, to to Bastian's point, you should apply regardless of, of you know, what's happening out there. You want to be in the queue uh, to, be, to, to, to get one of these loans. Um, you know, as far as you know, approval ratios and things, I, there's not enough data right now for us to, to, to kind of speak um, educatedly on that. Um, um, but, but definitely submit your application as soon as possible if you haven't already done so. Great. And one other question tied to nonprofits for you, Caesar. Um, a nonprofit organization applications for PPP loans are being asked about ownership. There is no ownership. How do we complete this section? The, the, the question of ownership is whom has the um, decision making when it comes to financial decisions. So a lot of uh, nonprofits will either have like a board. So if there's some multiple you know, people on a board that make the decision, then that would be considered multiple ownership, right? Um, if it's just one person, you're the director and you make all the final financial decisions, then that would fall into that. And I, and I use the air quotes under ownership because I know there's no ownership in a nonprofit, but for purposes of application and processing, um, there would be a single owner if you're the director and you're the only person that makes the decisions uh, on that. Great. Thank you. Um, Jonathan, I think that covers it. I know there were lots of questions and just appreciate our panelists being able to stay on and, and everyone that's joined for a little bit over time. But I think we've answered the majority of the questions. I know folks are asking about a link and if this is being recorded as well as the deck. So I believe we will be sending that out. And I know, Jonathan, you'll probably cover off on that. That's exactly right. So thank you, Candice. And, and thank you to the panelists for attending and, and providing us um, so much great information. Um, this was really helpful. I think we've been inundated with information. I think we have the news and articles and we don't know what to believe. And there's also the rumor mills or notes from friends. So thank you for helping us decipher everything. Um, just so you know, from, from a, an attendee standpoint, we're gonna go ahead and send you a copy of this recorded webinar as well as the deck um, within the next 24 hours. So stay tuned for that. If you have any questions in the meantime, also feel free to do uh, to email us at covidinfo at lauel.org. 
and we'll go ahead and uh, try to do our best to answer your question, even working with the panels if we need to, to, to get your question answered. So um, thank you again. And there will be another webinar um, to be scheduled. So stay tuned for that. We'll make sure that we, uh, we um, include all of you on that distribution list as well. So thank you again.